very much, Tom. Um, I'd just like to spend the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, taking you through an investor view. We were hoping to have Luke Hakes of Octopus here, but he can't quite make it this morning, but he will be around later on. So I was going to give you a bit of an investor view from experience, as I said earlier. We at eSynergy made our 50th investment yesterday, so we've made quite a few. So I was going to take you through that sort of process. So why will people give you uh, money? Well, because we're all very important. Well, everybody likes to think so, but a bit like Tom was saying earlier, it's a bit like selling yourself to the investors and not perhaps asking directly for money. So give you an idea of perhaps how many... Uh, how we filter things out. Did anybody here any idea how many proposals a normal fund manager, we're an early stage investor, but the larger boys, the Edens of this world, how many do you think they see every year? Anybody got any thoughts? That, yeah, yeah. It's, it's in the thousands. So you've got a thousand prospects popping into the top of the hopper, and how many investments do most people make in a year if you're a private business angel or a fund to be in single figures normally so the ratio is quite enormous so really what do you what do we look for and, and I think um, Tom talked about it but the strong management team the ability to execute a business plan now we know full well just as you probably know full well in your heart of hearts, that the business plan that you present to an investor on the day the money goes in is certainly not going to be the one that will be in place within six months or even six hours. External events are going to be changing those things. So we're looking for that ability in the management team. And as Tom said as well, recognition of what you don't have just as much as what you do have, that you have the ability to execute whatever plans put forward. And that's going to make the difference to success. So looking for a strong management team. And I think through some bitter experiences post-investment, one of the things that I've certainly learned is if you've got somebody who's got a wonderful idea and you think, well, this is great, but they're a bit uncontrollable, so we'll put a strong chairman in to keep them in place or something like that, it works for six months to 12 months and then it generally unravels itself. So you're looking for somebody or a team that you can trust from day one and have that ability to go forward from day one and don't need too many extras round them to knock them into shape. I think the things that we're then looking for are the next three group together, which is the growth business model, the market potential, <coughs> and excuse me, the exit potential. So here you're getting your head around the fact of what can the business do? How can it grow? What's the size of the market? And therefore, in the magical number that investors look at, What's it going to be worth in five years' time when there's the potential of an, expert, an exit? Now, exits, that's the magic number that people work on, which is why we want five years of figures that the lady was referring to, to earlier. But exits occur maybe earlier, maybe later. Generally, time from an early stage business to exit it, these days is reckoned by the British Venture Capital Association to be around about seven to eight years. So guys like yourselves will be exiting your business in seven or eight years' time. So we're looking for the potential to really grow your business. Tom alluded to this earlier about what's the business worth. Some people get very hung up about, oh, I've done all this hard work and I've got three patents, etc., etc. My business is worth a million pounds or whatever number they come to. And you say, well, how many have you sold? Um, we haven't sold any yet. How many customers have you got? Well, we haven't got any yet, but we've got all these patents. The business is only worth what people perceive it to be worth. So it's like you have this house, you think it's worth a million pounds. If nobody's going to buy it from you for a million pounds, then it's not really worth that sum of money. So quite often we will see people that we like, business proposals that we like, but if we can't agree that the current value of the business, or we can't agree between ourselves, the investors, and the uh, entrepreneurs and the management team what the business is worth, then the deal doesn't go through. And I always encourage people on these occasions not to think what your business is worth now, but what do you think it's going to be worth in five, ten years' time, and work back from that. So if you think you can sell your business in ten years' time for 20 million, and you, the founders, want to take five million 
pounds away from that deal at the end of it all, that's what would make you happy, then at the end of the day, you should be owning 25% of that business when it's sold. So that's the calculation to do in your head, not what I think it's worth now. Intellectual property, well, it gives you a bit of a head start, but I think if, as again, Tom rightly said, you don't have the ability to execute, then that intellectual property becomes fairly worthless and somebody else might make a better job of actually, actually executing the business. And then at the end of the day, when you're looking at <coughs> excuse me, businesses like yourselves, legal and financial due diligence plays a small part. We will check out that you are not discredited directors on Companies House and one or two other things, but the amount that we can do in terms of looking at your contracts, your financial status is very small for an early stage business in comparison with somebody selling their business that may be worth 20 million, uh, maybe turning over 20 million, something like that. And in those cases, you have a data room of contracts and financial facts and figures that would probably fill this stage. Um, at early stage, the contracts fill about that much. So it's all about looking at <clears throat> A, you, the management team, and B, the opportunity out there in the marketplace to, uh, to grow your business. So as far as we're concerned, we're balancing the risk and the reward. Everything's risky out there, whether you're a large corporate or a small company. So what are we judging things on? Management, that ability to execute. Deals take a long time to structure and, and getting to know you takes time. And we're sort of testing you. We're you know, checking out your integrity and things like that. We're checking out whether we think you will be open and honest with us as potential future investors and therefore get no nasty surprises. We're also, as I said earlier, looking at the business, the size of the market, the business model, intellectual property, whether you think that'll grow. And finally, will, you, will we be able to sell the business? Most early stage businesses are sold to somebody else. So who's going to buy you? Is there sort of liquidity in that market? So, you know, some markets particularly the likes of Microsoft and Google buying up and coming software companies is quite liquid, a lot going on there. The pharmaceutical companies are buying up the smaller boys because they're not doing their own internal research. Other markets, maybe not so buoyant. So not much point in building a business with investment if you can't exit. And that's <clears throat> where you go back to some of Tom's earlier points. If you can't show an exit, you won't get an investor. So you may as well go back to the point of growing the business organically uh, with your own money. So that's the sums that we're doing in our heads as investors. We do due diligence to check you out. We look at the key customers and market. That's probably the most important thing that uh, we would do as an investor is look at the market, what's going on there, what's potential out there in terms of competitive companies to yourselves. What do your customers say? We will always want to speak to probably three, four of your customers they might not have bought anything yet, but they might be a distribution partner you're chatting to or a customer. What do they say about you? What do they say about the market that you're selling into? Whenever we talk to potential investees, a lot of them are very nervous about, oh, we don't want to let these, you know, in case they say something not too pleasant about you. But at the end of the day, most businesses, early stage businesses, their customers or their potential customers are the biggest advocates of what they've got. So people are buying into you. So um, it's very difficult. Sometimes I'll pick up the phone to people and say, oh, do you mind spending 10 minutes on Mike Bowman from eSynergy? We're looking at investing in X company. Talk about them for a bit. And they sort of reluct, oh, yes, go on, Mike. You know, half an hour, an hour later, it's difficult to get them off the phone. They're waxing lyrical about you as a company, the market you're selling into. So always never be wary about that. So that's the key reference of it all. We want to look through the business plan. Um, you need one and a lot of hard work will go into it, but at some point during the process, we'll want to look into it. It's not a thing we'll want to look at early on. We want to be checking out the market and other things, but we will want to go through the business plan. We'll be checking you out as people and you might even not know, you might not know it's happening. Social networks, networking, we can go and try and find somebody who knows you, and this is becoming more and more, certainly for the larger VCs, will do their due diligence on you 
through networking and getting people to go and actually look around and dig around and find somebody you, you worked for 10 years ago, go and talk to them without you know, asking you, can I have five references, please? I want to ring them up. So it's a trend in the industry. As I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> we can look through all the finance and contracts. It's a very time consuming process, but at the end of the day, probably not too relevant to the business that we're investing in. I think one of the last things we ever do as investors, we believe you about your products, your technology, your idea. We will check it out, but it's not the first questions that we ask. We go through the, uh, the, the areas higher up the list before we'll sort of delve into the technology, do a pattern search, etc. if you do have patterns. So it's a thing we'll check out, but not necessarily something we'll check out early on. And we will look through areas of governance. So have you properly filed your accounts on companies' house, etc., etc.? And it's an important thing for us, particularly as investors, as good governance will be a thing that you will need to be doing going forward. And often we find that, ah, you know, you've got three founders and they all say they own, you know, 100 shares each. And we believe them. We go and look on Companies House and, well, actually, um, one of them's only got, one of them's got 200 shares, one of them's got 100 and another's got no shares. And you say, well, do you tell, oh, yes, well, we made that deal to swap it around amongst ourselves, but we didn't register things at Companies House. And we say, oh, well, we'll still carry on with the deal, but you've got to get all that right before we put our money in. A month goes by. While all that's sorted out, you're desperate for money. So actually having your business well organised before investors go in not only shows to us that you're the right management team for the job, it also saves time on actually doing the deal. <clears throat> 